I'd like to say a very warm welcome to Jess Medinger um, to join us this afternoon. Sure. Well, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. One of, one of the reasons for inviting you, and I think one of the things that's been so unique about your approach to all this, is that you really have become the kind of channel for a patient voice about what the reality is living with this condition. Could you just say a tiny bit about your whole kind of methodology? Because it's it's different to a kind of medical scientist research one in that sense. It's got more of a kind of social science research approach to it. Yeah. So I realized fairly early on that I had an audience of people who were very interested in what I was, the research I was doing. At this point in time, it was just looking at papers and trying to link it all together and piecing it together and presenting back to people what I thought was going on. But then once that audience grew to a certain point, I realized that I had an opportunity to actually use that audience to gather data, which nobody else was doing. Because as a community, we had all of these questions about what the hell was going on. And this is what, this is April, 2020. So, I mean, practically no GPs in the country were going, oh, long COVID's a thing. Long COVID didn't even have a name yet. <laughs> it was just a bunch of people who were really ill and didn't know why. And there were lots of ideas floating around, lots of theories floating around. And so what I could do very easily was to put out surveys and get N numbers of the hundreds or even thousands within a matter of days. And actually inside that data was huge amounts of insights. Um, which have subsequently been, you know, um, confirmed by published papers two years later. But I was sort of finding this stuff out two years ago. And there is obviously a limit to the sort of stuff you can find from a survey. Um, you know, it has to be things that people already know, for example. So one of the, an interesting one I did was look into pre-existing conditions to look for what could be risk factors for long COVID. Um, so something like that is the sort of thing that you can dig into quite well, or indeed antibody test results. So I've discovered that people um, were far more likely to be testing negative on those early antibody tests if they were suffering from long COVID than people who'd cleared the virus quickly um, or indeed had asymptomatic infections who were much more likely to, to test positive and antibody tests. So that suggests to us that there's something different going on in the immune response in people who have long COVID. But what was happening to these people was they were just going to their doctors, you know, over there in America, especially testing negative and antibody tests. You never had COVID. There's nothing wrong with you. It's anxiety. <laughs> the reality is, yes, you did have COVID. You now have a post viral condition and your immune system is all out of whack. That's the reality. Um, so for people to be able to see that of this community of long haulers, only 22% were testing positive for antibodies was incredibly validating because it's, it's not just me. This is a thing. This is real. And then again, two years later, we get papers showing the immune response is different, and antibody levels are lower, et cetera. Um, and like with the pre-existing conditions, you know, I could look at other uh, autoimmune conditions or immune related conditions to see where there might be links. So uh, diabetes doesn't seem to be linked. Rheumatoid arthritis, 15 times more prevalent in a long COVID community than the general population. Atopy, uh, so that's hay fever, asthma, eczema, two and a half times more prevalent in a long COVID population. Prior post viral fatigue, 25 times uh, more prevalent in a long COVID community. So there's all sorts of things we can start to get a picture about who's who's at risk of long COVID. And then also things like sex as well. So women, about 70-30, the, the, um, the sex split, sex distribution. Um, and again, age, so tending to be early to middle age. Activity levels, people very active beforehand. This is not, um, you know, these weren't all bed bound people beforehand. These, I think it was something like only 3% of, of my cohorts were inactive before getting COVID, 97% were active, and of those two thirds exercising vigorously at least three times a week. So, you know, something's going on here. And I, I found with this audience, it gave me an incredible opportunity, but also responsibility, <laughs> I felt, to, to use the position I found myself in to try and find out what was going on to some degree and answer some of the questions that the community had that could be asked in this manner. Now, there's a limit. I can't find out about whether people have got, you know, I can't do tests on people. <laughs> so there's a limit to the kind of research I can do. But at the same time, there was a lot of very powerful um, evidence that I could sort of dig out through this. And this is where actually my pr prior degree might be in engineering, but it gave me a sense of academic rigor, which I could apply to this setting. Yeah, and it's that, it's that data, it's the kind of numbers of responses that you've had to things that I think have been so 
validating and actually really kind of impacted the amount of discussion that there is because um, yes, people weren't kind of, the, the general sort of dismissiveness of some medics was um, was clearly not no longer valid. Do you, I mean, in terms of, you know, we're all, we're all kind of very excited that COVID produced the opportunity for there to be some investment in research, which um, for those people living with not only long COVID, but for those people who've also got MECFS in particular, and possibly fibromyalgia, we're very excited to see whether any of this could generate any research which could give any clues or anything about any of these other conditions too. In terms of the current science and research around long COVID, what, what would you rate as being the most kind of promising avenues of inquiry? Um, is it so it's a big topic, this. I will just yeah. start off by referring to the connective tissue disorders that have long been associated with ME-CFS. I'm actually about to do, um, I've been talking to a consultant called Philip Bull, um, and we've sort of generated some questions. So in my next follow-up survey of the first wave long haulers, which will be the, two, I've done it every six months, so six, 12, 18, 24 months, and we're just, now with September, we're hitting 30 months, so two and a half years. Um, and I'll be including a section there to ask about connective tissue disorders to see if we have any correlation in long COVID with those as well, because that would also be another interesting sort of piece of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, but onto the main question, what's the most promising science at the moment? So as an overview, since so relatively early in sort of the recognition of long COVID, there were sort of five possible theories about what might be causing it. Um, and just to run through them, we've got um, so direct tissue damage from the virus, um, autoimmunity, uh, or and then immune dysregulation, uh, viral persistence, and viral debris. Um, we've added two more recently, which are disruption of the microbiome and reactivation of latent viruses. So these are our sort of our overarching possible causes. Now, my suspicion is we're not going to find that just one of them is responsible. I think we're going to find that everybody's a little bit different, but there's perhaps two or three of these which are common to most long haulers. And underneath that, we've got the pathologies of what's been identified. So we've got the various different clotting pathologies. So there's the relatively well-known paper by Rezio Pretorius and Doug Kell that found microclots that hasn't been reproduced elsewhere yet but it does seem that and we know that COVID is a vascular condition so clotting does seem that it's part of the puzzle but again we've got to do some more work on that then we've got metabolic dysfunction mitochondrial dysfunction this is a subject very closely shared with MECFS MCAS is huge in long COVID dysautonomia is a major factor we've also got uh, hypoperfusion that seems to be going on and that's probably connected to the microclotting and hypoperfusion of brain tissue of every organ it seems um and then recently from say that what that is oh sorry um <laughs> oxygen oxygen isn't getting to the tissues we're not yes. getting enough oxygen to the tissues um and then akiko iwasaki um and david petrino recently had a, a paper published which found that cortisol levels were the most direct uh that's what i'm looking for marker obvious marker that held up across the long COVID people versus the controls and it showed that they were basically running at about half the level of cortisol and this doesn't seem to, to the controls so there's low cortisol levels for some reason is this exhausted adrenals is it something else um, certainly would explain why a bunch of us feel better on steroids and prednisolone um, so there's a lot of these avenues there's so many avenues to want to dig into um, I feel that viral persistence is probably the one that needs the most pressing research. Um, there's an organization that's recently been set up called the Long COVID Research Initiative, um, which, and they've done a great job. And I know one of the guys who's been involved in doing it. Um, and they've now got a investment from a guy called Vitalik Buterin, who's a big cryptocurrency guy, but he's put 15 million in and they're gonna be looking directly into viral persistence. Um, and it, you might think, so Polybio are the team that looking into that in America, um, and Dr. Amy Prowal is one of the leaders on that. Um, and you might think that if it's viral persistence, well, maybe this is, as, um, this is somewhere where long COVID would differ from MECFS. I'm not so sure about that. I think we've discovered there's enough research out there already showing that enteroviruses are hanging around in the guts in people who've got MECFS we may find something very similar is happening with COVID and with the spike protein generally. And what we might have is different viruses causing the same 
consequences in the body. So yes, there may be some differences there, but fundamentally, the reason why these conditions may look so similar is there is some degree of viral persistence, which is driving autoimmunity, which is driving immune dysregulation, which is driving <laughs> disruption of the microbiome, reactivating EBV and all sorts of other stuff, you know, and then all the consequential downstream pathologies, including, you know, the clotting, including the MCAS, including the dysautonomia. So it's such a complex world. There's a reason why MECFS is so poorly understood by the majority of the clinical and medical and academic profession and it's because it's bloody complicated there is no simple answer to it and it hasn't been cracked yet and i think the same applies to long covid the good thing right now is that we've got more attention more eyeballs more dollars being fired at this problem than ever before and whilst it will take some time i do believe that the point in time at which we crack long covid we will probably crack MECFS too so long answer to your question. I hope it broadly answered it. Yes, no, thank you. And um, yes, and, and the urgency is is incredible. I was reading that um, I think the prevalence of long COVID in the US is now 24 and plus million. Um, I think the the incidence in the UK is about half a million now, people living long term 400, with it. So 430,000 for over two years, 2 million with long COVID for more than six weeks. So anybody who's been ill for more than six weeks, that's two million in the UK, but 430,000 for over two years. It has a massive impact on people's ability to work and study and everything. So, I, I mean, there's I, I, I issue. Monumentally, I mean, these are people in the prime of their working lives. You know, I haven't done a single day of my old profession in two and a half years because I can't. I can't go and do a 14 hour day. It will just destroy me. You know, I could maybe just about get through it, but couldn't do another day's work after it that's for sure <laughs> on the next day yeah that's yeah. the key thing, isn't it so okay and just very very briefly um mm. the plotting issue is really interesting we are hoping but we haven't finalized it yet to have a talk on early december in, including professor caroline dalton who's a local um expert who is actually doing some of the testing locally so we're going to be following that what that line mm. of inquiry um so there's, I mean, you, you, you will have experienced um, the, the stigma and disbelief uh, um, attached to um, having this sort of invisible illness and also to um, that you will, you will have been told that you are suffering from anxiety, as I think everybody who's here today has probably been told at some point in their life. And, um, and maybe we do have anxiety, but that's Probably to secondary or tertiary um, yeah. long-term illness is exactly do you have any or have you learned any tips along the way about handling disbelieving medics get a new one yeah uh, i mean there's only so much that you can do I, the change is very difficult to, to force that change as a patient i think where it's going to where it's going <laughs> Someone's just said links to papers mentioned. Oh, okay. I don't know if that was for about the, the I can only read half the comments in the chat there as it's popped up. Um, I was just saying one of the things you can do, and some GPs are prepared to read papers that you send them. That's not all of them. Not all of them are that open-minded to go, what I thought was the medical landscape as I understood it. Oh, look, the patient sent me something. I'm now going to change my opinion on this. I don't know how many do that. The change has to kind of come from the top at the point in time at which we start getting large studies like the Recover Initiative, which the Americans are spending one billion dollars on. And it's going to be like a five year longitudinal study. I hope they're getting the methodology right. I hope they're looking at the right stuff because there was one dire study that came out of the American system recently as well that tried to say it was all in everyone's heads. Um, but assuming that they actually do that properly and actually find something clinically useful for doctors in there and that gets published in nature or science or JAMA or something then that might start to change stuff right because that will start to make waves at the point in time at which big journals start publishing papers that have something physical that can basically register with clinicians that they can actually do and practice I think we might start to see some changes in behaviors until then if you've got a medic who doesn't who's not helping you, a GP who's not helping you, you can try sending them some links to papers, you can try all the right things, but if they don't want to, I don't know how you persuade them, do you know what I mean? That you don't have the time to do so, they don't have the time to listen. 
So in theory, at the moment, there is supposedly now in every GP practice in Britain, there's supposed to be one doctor who's now familiar with long COVID, supposed to be. So you ought to be able to call up and ask to speak to that doctor. And they ought to then be able to go, yes, I will prescribe you some fexofenadine and some famotidine. I'll prescribe you some H1 and H2, and that will calm down your allergy, your MCAS type symptoms. Uh, you've got POTS. Okay, I'm actually going to do a quick NASA lean test. I, and I'll, then I'll maybe give you some conservative recommendations. And, but maybe if those don't work, I'll give you midadrine or ibabradine or some beta blockers. You know, there are things that doctors can do, but the doctors need to be switched on and they need to be able to be open minded enough to go, OK, I can give you symptomatic relief. We may not have clinical indications for long COVID and what I can be prescribing for long COVID directly, but you've got headaches. So let me give you something that we know we can prescribe for headaches or whatever. So it's so it's. It's so, so hard. I actually have a chapter in the book on how to approach and how to get your GP to help you, um, which I wrote with the help of two GPs who've got long COVID in the UK and one in America. Um, and there's a whole list of advice about how to prepare before the appointments, how to approach it during the appointments, how, and how to manage, it's in some ways, the ego of the doctor so that they, so you don't just waltz in and go, I've got microclots. Uh, give me some drugs. You have to kind of feed them the ingredients for them to make their own <laughs> conclusions and, and just spoon feeding them in the right way so they feel like they've come to that conclusion. And then you're much more likely to get the care you want. But it's hard. It, it, it Ultimately, you will always get much better care from a doctor that understands the complexity of the condition, whether it's MECFS or long COVID, and is prepared to be open minded and helpful with the lines of treatment that you can prescribe for it because you can manage symptoms to some degree with stuff that you can prescribe on the NHS. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to move us on to um, this ex extraordinary word called pacing, which is um, takes me a nanosecond to say, and certainly is a skill that I think can take years to kind of really crack. It is uh, incredibly easy to describe and incredibly difficult to do. You've certainly talked to patients a lot about about pacing, pacing the art mm. and the science of pacing. What would you? Um, what are the kind of key messages that that uh, come forward for you? So, um, hmm. so I think one of the hardest things about pacing is the fact that it's not as much as you can apply science to it. It's not a science because what you might be able to do one day, you won't be able to do another day, and there is no rhyme or reason as to why day, the other, the second day, not necessarily the day after, the other day you do that amount will smash you to bits and the first one wouldn't or vice versa. So yes, you can apply some science to it and you can say, I'm going to cap my activities at 0.55 of my maximum heart rate, which is one of the recommendations generally. And that's a good guide, but there are days when you might be able to do more of that. There might be days when you might be able to do less. And it's very difficult to know which they are. I mean, I, I, and I think generally there are sort of three fundamental rules with pacing and the way I look at it and the first one is do less we can't live the lives we used to do we have to understand that um the sheer volume of stuff <laughs> that you can do in a day is not the same anymore uh you have to take breaks any job you try and do it's going to be different for everyone how long they can do whatever that job is probably just take a break and how long that break is but you will need to take breaks um, you'll probably need to do whatever you're doing slower. So you can't basically wash the car at the same speed you used to, or you can't walk the kids to school at the same speed you used to, um, or, you know, you can't pack for a holiday at the same speed you used to, whatever it is. Um, and that you might also, the other part of this after do slower is do differently. So maybe you might need to consider having a stool in the shower because a shower is quite autonomically stressful because a you're standing up b you're raising your body temperature c you're moving around trying to do stuff then you're bending over then you're standing up again um and you might not have considered that having a shower was a challenging thing for your body to manage before but actually yeah kind of autonomically it is so having a shower stool yeah there you go do you need to fry an egg or do some cooking or maybe your stool could maybe you need a stool in the kitchen that you can just perch whilst you do that you know when can you sit down whilst doing a thing as opposed to doing that thing standing up so how how can you modify these activities how can you modify your travel how can you look at so for example learning what your own difficulties are makes a big difference so for example my sister 
uh, struggles hugely with visual processing. I struggle hugely with verbal processing. So I, I can manage an hour's driving better than I can manage an hour's Zoom call. For her, it's the other way around. Um, for me, I would rather spend two hours driving than do an hour's public transport because the walk, the going up the stairs, the rest of it, all the rest of it of doing that hours. So for me, I know that, okay, it might take longer doing this thing, but I can tolerate it better. So think about how you do all sorts of things because actually sometimes it's not always doing it the fastest way that's best <laughs> because if that, if that hits your particular weakness, you know. Um, so this is where it's an art form and, and it's an art form that you have to learn, you, you have to learn your own body and it takes years, right? It takes years and years. And a bunch of people on this chat will be able to do it far better than I can because I've been doing it for far longer. I still crash. I think, I don't know anybody with long COVID who has perfected the art of pacing so they never, never crash. You know, we all want to live some kind of life. We all want to maximize the amount of life we're capable of leading. And that means that we're always going to be testing the limits. And when those limits change without warning, well, sometimes I'll catch you out. So it's an art that can't be perfected, in my opinion. And the only science we've got really is, you know, 0.55, your maximum heart rate. <laughs> but... Do um, you've, you've recently written a handbook and you mm. even recorded it so it's an audio book um it's not out yet but um without doing too much of an advert could you give us a flavor of <laughs> uh the book and what it contains and uh yeah, go for it <laughs> so yeah so the idea of the book came to me when i realized that there was no single place no singular resource to go to for people who are suffering with long COVID. Let's say that you catch Omicron now and you develop long COVID and you go, oh, I'm not right. Well, where the hell do you go? What, where do you, where, where's the repository of information that tells people, A, what's going on with them as far as we best know, and B, what they should do about it in order to give themselves the best chance of recovery or manage the condition. And there's, you can just go and Google it, but God knows you'll hit, you'll come across all sorts of crackpot stuff out there on the internet. You know, there were, the, the, I, it sounds a bit grandiose, but the world, it felt like the world des desperately needed some singular resource that brought together everything that we've learned from the last two and a half years of long COVID, but also you know, decades of MECFS before that. We, you know, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here and the work that's gone on in the MECFS community. Um, so I wrote it with Professor Danny Altman, who's a professor of immunology at Imperial. Um, and we cover between us the sort of the clinical academic science on his part, um, and then the patient side from my part. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of very interesting stuff that Danny can talk about. But Equally, when it comes to talking about pacing and crashing, there's only so much that Danny can talk about, but I can, you know, I can talk to that, you know, in detail. I've tried to keep it as absolutely up to the minute date as we can be with it and very, very excited um, to see it finally get published. That's going to be an incredibly useful resource and really, really grateful mm. to you for capturing everything that you've covered in the journey so far and putting it in one succinct yeah. place and that'll be really helpful also very helpful that it's an audio book that makes it yes. a huge amount easier yes. for everybody um i've um got a couple of things i particularly wanted to pick out um which which have come up in the chat one is um does the book or can you comment at all on anything around diet managing diet metabolism mm. any of those sorts of related so issues one generally speaking there wasn't a lot of conflict in writing the book between me and danny um, but one of the areas where there was conflict was on the subject of diet, because uh, low histamine diets are, there is evidence out there for them. But generally speaking, if you go and speak to a group of <laughs> immunologists and the rest of it, they'll all be like, no evidence for that. The reality of what we see on the ground and hear on the ground, and certainly my own personal experience, is that a low histamine diet for me, absolutely critical. Um, so again, if you are displaying symptoms of MCAS or you previously had any history of ATP, you would be well advised to try it <laughs> and see if some of your symptoms abate. Um, uh, when it comes to metabolic um, sort of support, um, I did a, uh, so I spoke to a South African doctor called um, Adrian Wenzel, who published a paper um, arguing that NAD plus deficiency may be playing some role in long COVID. Um, and he recommended that an, 
Oh, you're on mute. What is NAD? Uh, it's, a, it's a critical coenzyme uh, necessary for the production of ATP, which is our body's unit of energy. Um, so if, you, if you're short of NAD+, plus, then your body is short of energy full stop, not just to go running about, but to power your organs, basic biological processes. Um, and one of the things you need to make uh, NAD+, plus is nicotinic acid. And because of a metabolic shift between two different pathways, it basically means that we're running out of that. Um, so supplementing your diet with vitamin B3, which is nicotinic acid, um, can be beneficial. I did a study which showed that it did seem to be beneficial with a P number of 0 0.01. Again, there's all sorts of, you know, you can shoot holes in my studies. They are essentially quick and dirty. But anecdotally and through my data, it did seem that niacin helped people. Um, amino acids are another thing that you could do to support metabolically. Um, there is some, I don't know if I've seen any data for helpfulness of that, but certainly theoretically it would help with some of the mitochondrial dysfunction that we're seeing in a way that the mitochondria may be malfunctioning in MECFS and long COVID. So yeah, that's diet and meta meta metabolism in a nutshell. And I would encourage people here to look on our Sheffield ME group .uk website. We've, we did a talk with Professor Carding from Norwich, which was about the gut biome. Um, that was incredibly informative and also kind of explored this whole thing about um, uh, fecal transplants mm. um, as well and their relevance to, to looking at ways of, of treating MECFS. Um, uh, so on that on that front, very quickly, there has only been one RCT published for long COVID, and it's on probiotics. Um, there's a probiotic, I've got it behind my desk here, called Phyto-V. There we go. Phyto-V and Your Gut Plus. Um, and that RCT demonstrated that it was helpful for people with long COVID. Uh, and I would imagine by association, probably MECFS2. <laughs> so, so yeah, look that up if that's of interest. Right, we had a, a number of questions sent to us in advance, um, mm. which I've shared with Jez, and uh, he's promised to do the uh, the high speed version of answers to them. So if you put your seatbelts on, he will yeah. run through those. Yeah, um, but they will be quite quick. If you watch YouTube later, you can do it at slower speed. But, yeah, there um, we go. So go question, question number one: How likely is it that living with long COVID will impact future health negatively? Well, right now we don't have any data on this. Um, the only thing we can do is look at people who have had MECFS for a long time or people who had SARS-1. Um, SARS-1 people are not necessarily well now, but it was a different virus. It was much more severe. A lot of them had organ damage um, and they're still suffering the effects of that organ damage sort of 18 years later. MECFS, um, yeah, <laughs> you can maybe add about this long since things like that, but basically we don't know, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, is any, no, question number two, is any effective treatment available on the NHS for people with long COVID? I mentioned this briefly earlier, H1, H2 antihistamines from a sympathetic GP. Um, also that you can get medications for, um, for POTS um, and which may also help with generic dysautonomia as well. Um, so yes, you can. Um, if, if you're particularly potsy, it's definitely worth seeing your GP. Um, if you're particularly MCAS, it's particularly worth seeing your GP and trying to get some antihistamines. But you may have to try more than one GP before you'll find one who goes, yes, this is fine. Um, do I, question number three, do you find the current advice for patients to pace activities helpful for long COVID? Um, I would say it is the single most important thing that anybody with long COVID can do. So yes. Um, question number four, are people with post-COVID illness being assessed for MECFS within a few weeks rather than long COVID? Um, no, it seems to me that doctors are tending to say this is long COVID rather than MECFS at the moment. What we're seeing with some people who've had long COVID for more than a year is some of them are going and some of them want to get a diagnosis of MECFS because it might help them with their work situation or other issues. Um, I think certainly a lot of people with long COVID would qualify uh, for a diagnosis of MECFS. Um, but right now, doctors are tending to call it long COVID if, you're, if you've got post-COVID illness, i.e. it's in the first few months. Uh, question number five, what proportion of those who catch COVID go on to qualify for a diagnosis of MECFS? Oh, same thing, most. <laughs> Anybody with post-exertional malaise, which is the vast majority. Uh, next question. Interested in the most effective use of antihistamines in relation to MCAS and in particular nighttime heart palpitations. 
So I made a film with Dr. Boon Lim, who's a cardiologist recently, and he spoke about this and how he thinks that these nighttime uh, heart palpitations that wake you up with your heart racing may well be due to mast cell degranulation during the night. So taking an evening antihistamine before you go to bed may well help. Now you may need to try a few different antihistamines because everybody reacts a little bit differently to each. So keep trying different ones until you find one that helps is the general rule for that. Um, what's next question? What can employers do to help employees who are suffering from long COVID? Well, the answer is a huge amount, but the first thing would I, I would say would be to understand that they are going to have to pace their working environment. They're going to have to probably need to work from home. They're going to need to have limited work hours during the day. They're going to need to have limited time on Zoom calls, for example, um, and lots of understanding about how much can be expected of them and that it's not always going to be the same. And there's going to be some days where they just need to take complete time out and that's going to have to be okay rather than you can't. So a huge amount of flexibility and understanding fundamentally, not all employers will have that. Someone says, I'm interested to know how he felt, uh, when he felt able to do more activities such as getting back to winter sports. So I made a film in, the, in February, which is a little bit controversial because I went out to the Alps and went skiing. And this all sounds incredibly dramatic and incredibly hardcore and wow, I must be better. No. <laughs> Travel was difficult, um, but I got out there and I made it my focus to basically dedicate all the time that I wasn't trying to ski uh, to rest, breath work, meditation. Uh, no work, no stress, no phone calls, none of that. And I was doing eight to 10 hours throughout the whole of the rest of the day of just all of that stuff to calm the autonomic system down and just to rest. When I was on the mountain, I was just simply standing up, sliding for 20 seconds, stopping for a minute or two, breathing, calming the heart rate down, doing it again, 20 seconds, stop every single lift. I wouldn't take part in conversation. I'd just sit there and do my breathing exercises. And I'd only be on the mountain for an hour and then I came off. Like that, it was doable. Doing it any other way, not doable. How did I know I was ready for that? Hmm. I just took a punt. I took a punt. I had a sense and I took a punt. Um, what blood tests can I ask my GP for that might show blood clotting abnormalities? None, unfortunately, in this country. You would need to do some fluorescence microscopy, and that's only going to happen in Mulheim in Germany at the moment. Although I think some place in South Africa might be setting it up, and it's supposed to be a few places possibly setting it up here. But right now, if you go into your doctor and say, I think I've got blood clotting anomalies, they're going to say, okay, we'll do all the normal tests. Oh, they're normal. Um, you could ask for a test for uh, antiphospholipid antibodies um, because they can cause clotting pathology, but they are obviously not present in everyone. Uh, although it does seem that they are more common in long COVID than the population generally. Yes, please tell us more about your MCAS theory. Totally makes sense. Every long COVID symptom can be tied back to mast cell dysfunction. Uh, such a huge topic. Watch my film with Lawrence Afrin on YouTube. We spend an hour talking about that in detail. Um, why are we seeing so many people who were uber active being disproportionately affected by long COVID? Is it mitochondrial malfunction? Uh, no, my theory on this is that I think it's autonomic stress. So I think people who were disproportionately active before were carrying a huge amount of physiological stress in their systems. So basically, they've been razz I certainly had. I've been razzing myself into the red for ages. And you get away with razzing yourself into the red for ages most of the time until a virus comes along. And hey, presto, you get knocked over the edge, out of the red and into the splat territory. And my theory is that it's it's autonomic as opposed to mitochondrial. Yes, there may well be mitochondrial dysfunction afterwards, but the primary thing that connects the prior activity with the risk of getting long COVID, I think is autonomic. Uh, and I think people who razz themselves to the max for too long over too many years uh, are the ones who are more likely to find themselves um, in a dysautonomic state uh, as a result of a COVID infection. Uh, another question, what kept him going? Uh, no choice. <laughs> you just do. I had some really rough weeks writing the book, really rough, where the stress of having to hit a deadline made my long COVID worse, my cognitive dysfunction worse, which meant it was even harder to write, which meant that I couldn't do it. And I got even more stressed and vicious loops from hell. I, I just, I don't know. I, I really, really struggled. It wasn't easy, but no choice, I guess. And, and I'm just trying to avoid crashing by just trying to be as disciplined as possible about pacing. 
are people finding that relapses, crashes are a common occurrence even years after infection affecting cognitive abilities again? Well, relapses and crashes are common. Uh, they are almost the defining attribute, I would say, of long COVID and to some degree ME-CFS, um, even years after. Um, there was a study recently that looked at people's recovery and found that 33% of them who felt they'd recovered subsequently had a relapse of symptoms at some point. So yeah, happens all the time. Uh, have I looked into hyperbaric oxygen treatment at all? My views on rivaroxaban for hypercoagular ability. Uh, yes, HBOT is really good, makes you feel really good, but most people tend to slip back to where they were before once they stop doing it. If you can afford to keep doing it all the time, great, <laughs> but not many of us can. Uh, it does, however, suggest that something oxygen tissue delivery related is going on that's a bit funky. The fact that HBOT helps as much as it does. Rivaroxaban uh, will probably help symptoms. Uh, there's a um, uh, there's a preprint showing that uh, sort of what they're calling triple therapy. So clopidogrel, apixaban, and uh, aspirin. So antiplatelets and a, a DOAC are helping symptoms. Same thing would probably apply to rivaroxaban. Um, but again, there are risks with all anticoagulants. Um, last question here, how can I access testing for microclots when GP long COVID clinic isn't aware such a thing exists? Go to Mulheim. If you want to have a test done, go to Mulheim. You can't, there's nothing here yet. But part of the problem is that the results from that paper that found it haven't been replicated elsewhere yet. And we haven't got hematologists in the UK having any kind of consensus on what they think the structures are that are being argued to be microclots or how, where they fit in the causality chain. So it's really hard. Uh, we need to have more studies replicating those results. Uh, and then we may start to see places popping up and long COVID clinics recognizing it as a problem. Uh, so uh, people asking about EBV reactivations. Um, yeah, it does seem to happen quite a bit. I kind of fancy that the grizzled feeling I felt in my throat early doors was an EBV reactivation in long COVID, but it went away. All that's gonna be doing is just turbocharging the long COVID. Um, again, we don't know too much about the mechanism yet because we don't really understand the mechanism of EBV post-viral fatigue in the first place. Um, uh, there's another one here. Are people actually recovering? The answer is yes, they are. Um, but of the, of, the, of the first waivers of which I am one, I would say people are recovering, but it's a trickle, not a flood. Um, but for each one who recovers randomly at two years or two and a half years, that should give us hope to all of us that it's not like, you know, the body is capable of resolving whatever the hell is going on. Um, and that, you know, I, I, I the, one of the really weird and difficult things about this is that I kind of feel that you have to accept your condition to a degree and not fight it and not be angry with it and not be bitter about it and not do all of this because you have to try and let the body be as calm as possible, right? So you have to accept your position, but at the same time, you don't want to accept your condition because you always want to hold this hope of recovery. So there's, that, there's one di dichotomy there. The other one is, well, we don't want to obsess over our symptoms because again, you get caught in this vicious loop. But at the same time, you have to be aware enough of your body that you go, I'm start, just starting to overdo it because I've just had that first bit of head pressure here that tells me I'm just overdoing it. So you have to be hyper aware, but you don't want to be hyper vigilant. <laughs> Tell me how you work that one out. So there's all of these horrible contradictions in managing the condition that just oh, make the whole thing so hard. Um, so yes, people are recovering. That's an answer to this one. There was another one a bit further down here. Sorry, excuse me, I'm just scrolling through. Um, are the NICE guidelines for long COVID being produced or updated? Hmm, do they contain the recommendations you've made today? Uh, so I don't know if they're being produced or updated. I very much doubt they contain the recommendations I'm giving because until you've got massive RCTs showing the efficacy of low histamine diets and niacin, they're not going to. Um, only GPs are, I guess, more likely to respond to a nice guideline. Yeah, exactly. But it's going to tell how long did it take us to get graded exercise therapy removed from the MECFS nice guidelines? Decades. So don't hold your breath on nice guidelines being particularly helpful for long COVID, I'm afraid. How can the profile of long COVID be improved to help understanding? Please comment regarding T cell exhaustion theory. Uh, um, how can the profile of long COVID be improved to help understanding? 
well, the book hopefully will do a little bit of that, right? But understanding requires, at the moment, reading 50 different research papers which aren't particularly accessible and trying to make your own sense of your own version of a jigsaw puzzle. Everybody's got their own... Imagine like you've got a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and there's 250 random pieces just all over the floor and different people are organizing them in different shapes and going, that's what I think the shape is. Someone else organizes them in a different thing. Someone else says, I don't even see, that's not even a jigsaw puzzle and hoovers it all up. So, <laughs> you know, it's, um, I, how do we improve understanding? Huge studies, well-recognized, published in major journals, picked up by media, will take ages, unfortunately. Please comment regarding T cell exhaustion theory. Um, my only comment is it looks like something that needs further research. It's very interesting, probably implicated, um, but we need we don't we still don't quite understand the mechanism of this. The idea of the T cell exhaustion suggests viral persistence. We're starting to get lots of circumstantial evidence that points at viral persistence, and this is one of those bits of circumstantial evidence, um, which puts the pressure on direct studies looking for viral persistence you know we want to have those as soon as possible and that's why the work that the lcri is doing with polybio is so important and i really hope they can get somewhere because um amy prowell is great and they are looking in all the right places so a little bit of patience there hopefully how useful do you think natto kinase is for dispersing the clots theoretically yes i can't really comment um great i think that's it <laughs> lovely Really appreciate this. Uh, it's a brilliant contribution to the field. Thank you, Jez. Yeah. And thank, thank you. you thank you, everyone. Else. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope that someone has maybe just heard something that might make a one percent difference to managing their day to day. Because that's you know what we're trying to do is help as many people as possible make whatever incremental difference they can that a makes their days better and b increases the chance of recovery. So good luck out there, everyone. Best wishes and uh, take, look after yourselves. <laughs>